OK, uh, let's kick this off. So maybe first slide. So easy question. Uh, would you use a personalized AI? And so an assistant in your pocket, something that you could ask it any question. You could ask it for advice. You could ask it to respond to your parents. You could ask it to take messages for you. You could ask it to diagnose whatever you had, say, from seeing a doctor. Uh, would you use this? Would you use a personalized AI in your pocket? Now, the next question is, would you use this, or would you give this AI access to every text message that you've ever had, your entire computer today, and in your past, and in your future, every phone call that you had, every private message that you'd ever sent, everything that you said from this point going forward, would you feel comfortable giving this AI all of this information? Now, it's really, really interesting because we've asked these two questions to probably about 2,000 people now. And the answer is pretty much unanimously the same. The answer to the first question is, yes, I'd love that. It'd be amazing. The answer to the second question is, I don't think I would feel comfortable doing that. And that's about like 95 to 96% of people. Next. And so the question is, why not? Why wouldn't you feel comfortable with that? And I think the answer to this question is where Nillion starts to become really interesting, and is the intersection of why we believe something like Nillion should exist. Because something like personalized AI is coming. Like, it's just around the corner. You know, I think 10 years ago, it would have seemed far-fetched. But today, it obviously seems like it'll be here in just a handful of years, maybe less. And so then the question is, if 95% of the people that we've asked this question to have said, no, I'm not comfortable giving this information to an AI, then our belief is, without Nillion or something like it, you block the mass adoption of something as incredible as personalized AI. And so, and it's not just personalized AI. 75% of companies today have banned ChatGPT as use because of data concerns or privacy concerns. Uh, some of you guys may have remembered uh, Samsung, I think, went through a pretty bad leak a couple of months ago. And so you have this really incredible technology, but you also have it gated, not just in enterprise, but also in personal comfort of being able to, to use it. But then the immediate question that I ask myself is, yes, you know, 95% of people of the 2,000 people we asked basically said no. But then I ask myself the question is like, how come I haven't cared until now? And you might be asking yourself the question, why haven't you cared until now? I mean, I know that Gmail allows Google to look at all my emails, and I don't care. I still use it. I know that ChatGPT probably looks at every prompt that I send in, and I'm more cautious there, but I still use it. I still use Instagram. I still use Facebook. And I have never actually thought to not use it. But for whatever reason, it does feel like we've kind of reached this intersection point. And I think the way that we've looked at data can maybe help you answer that question, because not all data is created equal. And so we've actually broken data down into three categories. There's level one data, which is superficial data. It's things like stuff that you post on Instagram. It's your search history. And it's things that we've essentially shown and I've shown to myself that we don't really care if the world can see this data. We post things online on social media, and we kind of expect that people will see it. Level two data goes a little bit deeper than that. This is your, I would say, your digital footprint. And it's things like your location based on your phone or your computer. Uh, it's things like your cell phone records being able to triangulate where you are. Now, there have been arguments over the years that the level two data also matters, but historically speaking, people still haven't really seemed to care. 
And using myself as an example, I still use my iPhone. I don't care if there's a tracking device in my car if I drive a Tesla. I still use those things freely. And I would go so far to say that most of you guys use those things freely too. Now, level three data is where it actually starts to get interesting. Level three data is things like your healthcare records or your private conversations with a loved one or explicit conversations with people uh, that you may have had. It could be things like your banking details or your social security number. Now, really interesting, when you hit level three, that's when people start to be like, I don't know if I would be comfortable sharing that publicly. And they go out of their way to protect it. Now, something really interesting has happened over the last couple of years with AI and with data. And the analogy that I like to use is, you know, Oppenheimer was a huge movie uh, last year over the summer. And if you really think about that as an analogy, you know, something like plutonium wasn't really much of anything until it became something. Right? And so by itself, it's just an element. But when you combine it with technology or knowledge, you get a bomb, a big one. And the same thing is happening with data today. Level one data, level two data, and I'll go so far to say as even level three data, by itself isn't actually that interesting. But when you combine it with the power of a global AI network, that's where you create this thing. It's, not, it's a nuclear bomb, I guess, in a data sense. And if you look at it from that standpoint, it's what we consider to be the data war. You know, you reach this place where if you really think about the first question, who would use a personalized AI or an AI assistant in your pocket? And if you really extrapolate that and you said, okay, what if we were able to create a world where everyone feeds all of their data into this model, and if you've been keeping track, there are now wearables that are getting released, like Tag, where you wear something and it captures everything about you. It captures all your conversations, captures all, of, all the things that you say. It's almost like an Alexa that's always on, and it's just soaking everything up to essentially make this digital clone of yourself. Now, if someone hacked into my phone or they hacked into my records, it's pretty bad, like pre-AI, like it's not good. But post-AI, and once these technologies mature, what if someone actually hacked into the digital clone of you? The clone of you that had everything that you said and all of your data and all of your documents and every conversation that you've had, every computer that you've ever owned, everything that you've ever stored into your phone, and they had that. Imagine a chat GPT, if you're John, it's a John GPT. And someone had that, and they could ask this GPT anything about you. What did you do last week? What were the, 10 bank, the biggest banking transactions that you made last year? How do I access things like your will or whatever else? I think it's pretty catastrophic if someone were to be able to get control of the cloned version of you. And so we've entered what we call the data wars, where you have the centralized companies that are working to capture and own and monetize all of your data. And then you have the individuals that are working in whatever way they can to still use these technologies, but to fend off the ever increasing ownership of these centralized companies. And that's why I think Nillion is so interesting. What Nillion is building is the base layer for humanity's most important information. And if you think about that, clearly it's AI data, it's medical data, it's identity data, and within Web3, it's the trading data that you have. Thanks. Now, what's the solution? So the solution is something that we call blind computation. And it's a really interesting set of innovations for built on what you would call privacy-enhancing technologies. Within there are a class of technologies such as multi-party computation, MPC, uh, fully homomorphic encryption, FHE, and zero knowledge proofs, ZKP. And with this, or these sets of technologies, we're able to actually build a decentralized network that takes important data and stores it in a way that you can't recognize the data, 
but you're still able to use the data to compute the data as though you had it. So for instance, if you gave me all of your identifying data and all the data that we sucked up, and you ran it on top of, say, an AI model, the AI model could be your clone, but it wouldn't actually know what it's computing as it's giving you answers to the things that it's giving you answers for. And so this is an overview of blind computation. You take something private, maybe it's like a private key. You mask it uh, with a mask so you can't recognize what it is. And then you distribute it across a network. And each box is a different node in a network. Each box holds a different piece of access to the overall data. But the magic is when you have all the boxes within this network, even though they don't know what they're holding, they can still collectively collaborate and run computations on the data, even though they have no idea what they're computing either. And so that's the blind computation, as the name uh, alludes to. And that gives you the output. And so now you have this like, really interesting decentralized solution for that first question, where it's like, yes, do you want a personalized AI in your pocket? Yeah, sure, why not? Right, it's amazing. Uh, two, would you be comfortable giving that AI all of your data? And the answer is no. But what if you could route all the data through something like Nillion, and you knew for a fact that the nodes that were holding onto the data had no idea what they were holding, but could still run the computations off of your data to essentially be your personalized AI model? Essentially, would you share your data if you knew with full cryptographic security that your data would still be yours, and no one else could take it or use it, and that it wouldn't be possible for someone to come and steal your digital clone. Would you be comfortable then with sharing your data? And the answer most of the time is yes. And so you unlock the potential or the mass adoption for things like personalized AI. And so our big thing is uh, private inputs, uh, public trust. And public trust is the basis of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the entire blockchain uh, renaissance. And we find it really interesting because blockchains were so focused on just transactions, but there's an entire world of data beyond transactions, an entire world of things that you can do using decentralized technologies. And we find it really fascinating that when you expand it to data, you have these really fascinating, interesting use cases and compelling ones like personalized AI or like private trading data or medical data, or medical healthcare studies, uh, and so on. And the thing that I think got all of us so excited about Nillion at the beginning was that I, I actually remember um, when Ethereum first came out in 2015, 2016, and uh, was very fortunate to have a friend to tell me to start to look into it. Um, I thought it was so interesting because even then, you knew that if you were kind of in the space, you had a sense that if you could take a smart contract and put it on Bitcoin and you could compute things, you could just see that a lot of interesting things could happen. Like I never could have called NFTs, had no idea DeFi would be as big as it ended up becoming, but I knew it would be something. And if we look at Ethereum today, it really became something. Like from art to finance to everything in between, it's created this entire fascinating ecosystem. And I think the excitement behind something like Nillion was that, OK, that was for financial transactions. If we move it and look at the world of the rest of data, what can you do if you unlock that in a decentralized technology fashion? And we really believe that in the same way Ethereum decentralized computing with smart contracts that Nillion brings to life blind computation to then open up another green space of many fascinating use cases when you fundamentally change the way that you store and use highly sensitive, private, high value data. And so I've given you a few examples today. You know, we've talked about personalized AI. Uh, this, we talked about healthcare. But it's our thesis that something like blind computation and in a decentralized form unlocks what we call sleeping giant industries. And these are industries that 
have actually been held back because of these data limitations. And we believe that when you unlock their potential with new technology, you open up things like personalized AI. You introduce the ability to have things like private decentralized exchanges in Web3. You can take things like healthcare data from 20 different hospitals and run better studies to either get faster breakthroughs in cancer research or to figure out better drugs and to move through the process quicker. You can do things like storing, say, your secrets, like your private keys or sensitive documents in this decentralized network that lives up in the cloud in the same way that Bitcoin does for store of value. And you can store things like your digital identities without needing to rely on these centralized entities. And this, are just a few examples. You, know, you really open up this universe of potentially very fascinating things that you can do. And so, as we've been going around and sharing nearly, and people have been getting really excited, and we honestly fundamentally believe that this is a data renaissance. And with the advent and the intersection of things like AI and the intersection of things like decentralized technologies, we've really entered this really interesting age where everyone knows that data is the most valuable resource in the world now. And we are at the cutting edge of being able to unlock more and more aspects of value of data. And we think that with things like Nillion, uh, you create a future where you can do things that never seem possible, like having a digital clone of yourself. And that's why we're so excited by this. So we encourage you guys to take a deeper look and if this is compelling to you in the same way that it was compelling to us, that you join us in the data renaissance. Thank you.